Okay, we're live. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, uh, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this uh, episode of Ready with an Answer. Uh, this is our second uh, discussion on the subject of Calvinism. And today we're going to take on the, uh, the, all the doctrines of TULIP. Uh, they, Calvinism has uh, an, there's an acronym that they use, and it's T-U-L-I-P, spells TULIP, but each of the letters stands for one of the doctrines of Calvinism. So we're going to discuss that, and I would say that we are going to trample on the TULIP. Uh, we're not going to be doing any tiptoeing around today. We're going to come right after you if you believe in any of these uh, TULIP doctrines. Um, before we get into this, though, uh, let's introduce the, the panelists, and uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Brother B uh, Bill in England, Bill Cuthbert. You want to say, you want to say hi to, to, to the audience first? Yep. Hello, audience. Pray that you'd be attentive to today's lesson and that you, you might learn something. <laughs> yeah, I suspect they're going to learn a lot today. And uh, the interesting thing about discussing Calvinism is that um, we get a lot of thumbs up and then we get a lot of thumbs down because the Calvinists are going to hate everything we have to say. Uh, and then uh, those of us who, who uh, uh, despise Calvinism, of course, they're going to love what we have to say. So it ought to be interesting to see the reactions to the show. Let's, let's introduce also Brother uh, Wayne uh, from England. Both Bill and Wayne are in England. And uh, unfortunately, he's not able to uh, do any audio but he's posting a lot of comments and he'll be posting a lot of verses and so he'll be a big help and his wife Elaine is in the background there too help she's uh, I don't know is Elaine your right hand person or is Wayne Elaine's right hand man that's the question <laughs> let's see what Wayne says he, he's posting I have a suspicion He's he'd get ready to post his comment. Let me see. Uh, I thought it was very good. We said last week I was the puppet. Yeah. So uh, we don't believe in uh, the the puppet of Calvinism, but uh, Wayne says that he is his wife's puppet. <laughs> well, I always say a happy a happy wife is a happy life. So you're very wise to to do that, brother Wayne. Okay, let's go uh, right into this, and uh, I'm going to just kind of define each of the uh, one, one point at a time of TULIP, and then we will discuss it. Uh, uh, first is the letter T, and it stands for total depravity, uh, or sometimes it's referred to as total inability. And uh, the, the basic idea is that that man, every man that's born, we are born depraved. Um, uh, but in, in uh, Calvinism, they think we're born totally depraved. Uh, and uh, we, we don't agree with Calvinism. And we say, yeah, man is depraved, but we're not totally depraved. We are capable of doing some good things. Uh, man is, obviously does some good things. So uh, if you're totally depraved, it means you're only able to do bad things. So um, uh, if we were totally depraved, we, if we can't be totally depraved, otherwise no one would ever give uh, to uh, disabled uh, veterans, uh, uh, every man who, who uh, crossed paths with, um, with my wife would, would try to rape her if, if we were totally depraved. Now uh, the other, the, to the idea of being total, total inability means that man does not have the ability to believe in Jesus for salvation, he he does he's not uh, unable because uh, they use the verse that uh, uh, man is uh, dead in in his sins and uh, it, therefore they think if a man is dead he's not able to make decisions he's not able to put believe trust have faith in Jesus so. Um, whether it's total depravity or total inability, uh, both of these are problems for Calvinism because it's obvious man does have a free will and man is capable of doing good things and man is capable of making decisions. So let me ask Brother 
Brother uh, Bill to, to respond to the idea of just the concept. Uh, if you want to refer to any verses, it's okay. But if you, I'd like for you to just get your, your, your own opinion about the concept of total depravity or, or total inability. We'll start with, with uh, Bill. Well, yeah, yeah, look, it says you've made the point there clearly. You know, if we was totally deprived of absolutely anything godly whatsoever, that then mankind would be, you know, killing, raping, and pillaging, you know, from, you know, from the moment they're old enough to do so, you know. So it's it's a stupid concept, you know. We know we are deprived in the sense that we we miss out, you know, on God's perfection and glory because of fall in our fallen state. But to say we're totally deprived is 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 silliness. Mm -hmm. And, and what about the idea of being a uh, total inability, that man does not have the ability to, uh, because he's spiritually dead, he doesn't have the ability to believe or, or uh, you know, choose uh, Jesus? Well, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's nonsense itself, isn't it? Because we even know that, you know, for the unbeliever, that, that the Holy Ghost was sent to, to convict the world of sin. So that's the whole world. So the Holy Ghost is on earth, you know, trying to draw people freely through choice, you know, unto Christ. You know, if, it, if that wasn't so, then, you know, the scripture would have said, you know, the Holy Ghost has come to convict the elect of sin and draw them. But it doesn't, you know, it's come to convict the whole world of sin and to draw the whole world unto Christ. Mm hmm Okay. Uh Brother Wayne, uh, you have anything you want to post uh, concerning this yet? If, if you do, we'll discuss that. Otherwise, I'm going to read from just a couple uh, uh, an article that uh, Brother Wayne put up uh, probably a couple of weeks ago, uh, and then we'll comment on that. Uh, this author, uh, this is Curtis Hudson. Um, do you know much about Curtis Hudson? Uh, he happens to be my all-time favorite preacher. Uh, so let's first discuss him before we even read what he had to say. Uh, Brother Bill, are you familiar with uh, Dr. Curtis Hudson? Yeah, yeah, he's brilliant. I, 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 I like. Yeah, yeah. I've, got couple, I've even got a couple of his videos on my channel. Yeah, he's. Uh, I have a, an, a playlist of you know probably about a dozen of his videos, and. Uh, uh, He's he's with the Lord. I think he he went to be with the Lord. I don't know, maybe ten years ago or so. It's been a while, um, but his videos remain up. Uh, they're posted on my channel and other people's channels, and so I really highly recommend everybody. Uh, if you can find any Curtis Hudson uh, sermons to watch, you'll be blessed. So this is an article by Curtis Hudson, and I'll just read it a little bit, and then then we can uh, uh, discuss it. He says, total ability, total inability. By total inability, Calvin meant that a lost sinner cannot come to Jesus Christ and trust him as Savior unless he is foreordained to come to Christ. By total inability, he meant that no man has the ability to come to Christ, and unless God overpowers him and gives him that ability, he will never come to Christ. Okay, so there, he, he's got a lot more to say, but let's discuss this one point at a time. Uh, now, uh, he's talking about unless God overpowers him and gives him this ability. Um, are you familiar with the concept that, that Calvinists believe that um, we, can, we do not first believe in Jesus and then get regenerated or born again? They have it backwards. They say that God must regenerate us and we are born again, and that once we're alive, now we can... Uh, understand spiritual things, and then we we put our faith in Jesus. Then, so they believe that uh, re uh, that regeneration or the new birth comes first. God overpowers people, makes them uh, regenerated, and then comes faith. But I think all of us here we we think it's the other way that that a, a man has a free will. When we understand our need for Jesus and we put our faith in him, then we get born again and regenerated. So, um, Brother Bill, what, would you comment on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the truth there. You know, it, it is putting the, the cart 
cart before the horse. You know, and Lordship Salvationists do that as well. You know, they they require you do this, that, and everything else before you be saved. It's just, yeah, it's, it's stupid. And I was reading today, and and I, just one verse dawned upon me. Without all the obvious verses that we that we know that can disprove, you know, you know what we're talking about, I stumbled across uh, in in John chapter five, verses thirty nine and forty. You know, initially you wouldn't think, well, well, that's got what's that got to do with anything? But just one little word makes it. It's all right if I read it out. Yeah, please. Yeah, it says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are which testify of me. And then it goes, and ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. Not that you cannot come to me, or, or that it says you will not. So they're choosing there to not come to Christ, and they're not becoming saved. So they can't be, you know, if it was the other way around, they'd get saved, and that verse wouldn't apply. It'd be, it'd be pointless having that verse in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, if they are regenerate before, it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Well, Bill, let me uh, comment on what you just said there. Uh, I, I think that this proves that you are a great man, what you just said. Because the next thing I'm going to read from Curtis Hudson is he makes exactly the same point. All right. That's the result. Yeah, I, I think I think if if we say something and we see that well, Curtis Hudson said the same thing. That's a good indication that you're a pretty darn smart guy. Okay, oh. <laughs> <laughs> read what read what he says here. Okay, so um, the Bible teaches total depravity, and I believe in total depravity. But that simply means that there is nothing good in man to earn or deserve salvation. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Uh, so he says that uh, even though we're, we're totally depraved, it doesn't mean that we're incapable of believing. It just means that we're, as he phrases it, there is nothing good in man to earn or deserve salvation. And he goes on to say that... Uh, uh, a preacher brought a wonderful sermon on the on the depravity of the human heart, and when he has finished his message, someone came to him and said, "I want you you to know I can't swallow that depraved heart that you preached about." The preacher smiled and said, "You don't have to swallow it; it's already in you." <laughs> uh, now he says, "While the Bible teaches the depravity of the human race, it nowhere teaches in total inability." The Bible never hints that people are lost because they have no ability to come to Christ. The language of Jesus was, Ye will not come to me that ye might have life. John 5.40. I think that's the same verse you just read. So uh, Curtis Hudson says, Notice, it is not a matter of whether or not you can come to Christ. It is a matter of whether or not you will come to Christ. Brother Bill? Well, that's, that's spot on. I, I wasn't even aware that Curtis Hudson, you know, made that point. So that's, you know, so I'm in good company there. Yes, yes, I agree. It's uh, uh, whenever we agree with him, it's a good sign that you're on the right track. Uh, and uh, you know, Curtis Hudson, uh, even though he, he's deceased now, uh, you got people that knew him and, and were like mentored by him, I think, and, and really loved him. You got uh, Hank Lindstrom, uh, and, and there are some good Hank Lindstrom videos up on YouTube. And we, we all know Yankee Arnold. Yankee Arnold, I think, was a, a friend or a mentor by also Curtis Hudson. All three of them uh, are, do a great job teaching the free grace message. Uh, so now... Let me see if my notes have anything here. Uh, uh, I'm going to read a verse here. It, it says, Mark 8.34. Um, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whosoever will come. So here's another verse. Bill, that, that Jesus is saying, whoever will come. He's, he, he should have said, if Calvin was correct, Jesus should have said, whoever can come. 
you know. Um, let me see. Wayne has a post up here. Let's read that. Uh, okay, I, he put up a, a I think a de dictionary definition of the word depraved, and it says to make bad or worse, to impair good qualities, to make bad qualities worse. Uh, uh, to vitiate, vitiate or, or to corrupt as to deprave manners, morals, government, laws, to deprave the heart, mind, will, understanding, taste, principles. Um, and then there's that verse that uh, Curtis Hudson quoted is, uh, uh, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. This is what I like to tell Mormons when I'm talking to them. They say, just read the Book of Mormon and pray, and, and God will reveal to you if it's true, and you'll get a burning in your bosom. And, and I said, what does that mean? It's like you'll, it's, you'll, you'll understand it in your heart? And they say, yeah. And I said, well, do you know the Bible says that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? The Bible says that whoever trusts his own heart is a fool. So as a Mormon, are you going to just trust your heart? It says you're a fool if you trust your heart. You have to go by what the scriptures say. So, yeah, our, our heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. We are depraved, but we do have minds. We do use reason, and we can make decisions. Um, now, but also, uh, Bill, if you want to comment on that, let me know before I go on. What, what on that specific point or, or on total depravity? Yeah, anything on total depravity or the point I just made that uh, uh, the, the heart of man is, is so uh, depraved that we should, not trust, we should not trust our heart. We used, need to read the scriptures and get our truth from the scriptures. Well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's where, you know, which, uh, Timothy tells us that, you know, well, Paul, Paul's epistle to Timothy tells us that. You know, the study, the sure sense of truth. So you right. can't always just trust what your heart believes. And you had the same scenario, didn't you, with Thessalonica and, and the Marines. You know, the Marines weren't just going to take on, you know, what they initially felt in our heart that it was a good message. They, they studied, didn't they, to see if these things were true. So, you know, so yeah, obviously you need to, you need to connect your brain in, in you know, in this in this situation, as in regard to you know what you was talking in regard to the Mormons, yes. but yeah, you know, with total depravity, it's just there's just so many verses. We won't have time to read them all, but I've got I've got a whole list here, the the, the verses that that contradict what what Calvinism believes. Okay, we will go through we will go through all those verses, uh, uh, and. Uh, you know, we've got plenty of time to, to do that. Let me see what Wayne posted here. Uh, he says, Calvinism also believes that man cannot choose God to be saved. Uh, no, Calvinism also believes that man cannot choose God to be saved. Oh yeah, man cannot choose. Again, God does it all. He chooses us, but we do not choose him. But if sinners cannot choose God, then why did God tell them to choose him? And here's a uh, uh, J-O-S, what does J-O-S stand for? Uh, Joshua? Is there, no, what is that? What's that book? Well, whatever it is, it's chapter 24, verse 15. It's embarrassed, I don't know what J-O-S means. Uh, <laughs> and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So here's it's clearly saying that uh, man can choose. And he's even saying, choose you this day. Why would God say, choose, choose God, or you can choose a false god, make a decision. If men couldn't make a decision and choose, why are we told to do it in that verse, Brother Bill? Well, that's exactly right, yeah. That's exactly right. I'm, I'm looking at the list myself there, and I'm glad he put, because I was going to quote that, Deuteronomy 30, 19. You know, we're, 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 we're given a choice, you know, to choose this day whom you're going to serve. 
Mm. You know, there's no free will with so depraved beyond measure. You know, and this was before Christ. You know, before you know, <laughs> the Holy Ghost was was poured on on mass into the world, and they could still have a choice then. But you know, so there was even more depraved. Mm. You know, I also made the point. I've just posted it about Isaiah one eighteen. Where God, you know, for all those, you know, come now, let us reason together. Now, if we was to all mankind was totally depraved beyond help, then why would even God ask man to reason with him? You know, so there is still an element of reasonableness, and we're, and we're not completely depraved beyond any help whatsoever, in that sense. Yeah. Uh, to me, uh, uh, Calvinists could have, have no answer to these. These clearly tell us that God is telling us to choose, telling us to believe, you know, uh, and, and so uh, for them to come to the conclusion that man does not have the ability to believe, the ability to choose God and put their faith in our Savior Jesus, uh, it, it's just, it's mind-boggling how they can ignore or twist all these verses that are so clear. Uh, he has, an, let's also discuss another verse that Brother Wayne posted here, it says 1 Kings 18.21, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hath have thee between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if, if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. So God is asking them to make a decision right there. And there's more, but let's go back to what uh, uh, Curtis Hudson says about this. Uh, um, so he says it's not a matter if you can come to Jesus, it's a matter if, of if you will come to Jesus. So, you know, we, we use this term free will, and that means that man uh, can freely choose, will, uh, he has the, uh, can exercise his will and come to Christ. And it, his will is, uh, um, he, he does have the will, and he does have the ability to use it freely to make a decision. So uh, uh, here's another point by Curtis Hudson. Jesus looked over Jerusalem and wept and said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. That's Matthew 23, 37. Here again, notice, he did not say, how often would I have gathered you together, but you could not. No, he said, ye would not. It was not a matter of whether they could, it was a matter of whether they would. Okay, there's a good verse by Curtis Hudson put up for us. You want to say anything about that one? I've always loved that verse too, and you can see that Jesus has a broken heart. Uh, to me, it's clear that verse is showing that the sadness, the broken heart of Jesus, because the people will not. He wants them to come. So if he wants them to come to him, but they will not, then Jesus is admitting that, that he does not uh, exercise uh, you know, sovereign power and force people to come to him. He asks them to come, and he's sad when they choose not to. Brother Bill? Yep, spot on, spot on. I, you know, I was going to, believe it or not, I've got that verse written down for later on. And that, that, ties in, uh, that ties into the eye in Tulip later on. Uh -huh. but, you know, I, but yeah, same point is, you know, that the, I, won't, I won't go too much into it because it does come under irresistible grace, they say. Okay. But, but clearly, the, you know, the, the children of Israel were resistant. You know, yep. they, they resisted God's grace and they rejected their Messiah. So that's that's, that's silliness. Yeah. Uh, so here is showing that, man, uh, this idea of total inability is stupid. And also, as you said, it'll apply to another uh, letter in Tulip, uh, Irresistible Grace, because they obviously are resisting. And when Jesus says, I really want you to come to me, and they resist it. Um, but do you agree with me? I mean... Do you ever get really like sad for Jesus when you read that verse and you see that he he has such a broken heart and he's so sad uh, uh, because he's he really wants them to come to him and he wants to embrace them as his children and, and they they would not do it. 
Okay, let's go to, uh, uh, let me see, oh, uh, Wayne posted Deuteronomy 30.19, let's see what that says. Uh, I called heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life, <laughs> that both thou and thy seed may live. <sighs> Oh man, I can't help but laugh. It's so stupid that Calvin is saying that we don't, we we cannot choose. Over and over again, we see verses where God is asking them people to choose and to make a decision. Brother Bill. Well, yeah, that was that's that's a classic one, and that that was the one that 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 Wayne has beat me to because you know I was going to use that one as well because it's you know it's even in the Old Testament, you know, before the Holy Ghost was poured out. Before all these revelations, you know, they had a choice even then, and they was more depraved in 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 a spiritual sense then than what people are, you know, now because we have the full canon of scripture, you know, we have all these blessings from God, you know, whereas then it, it was a harder time, but they still was able to make a choice to freely choose to serve the Lord or or, or reject the Lord. So it it knocks Calvinism, you know, dead. Just in that one verse from the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's you know we could go on and on. There's tons of verses that prove this point, but uh, we're going to discuss some of them. And uh, I think that uh, we are trampling on the letter T. We're trampling on tulip. We're just showing that it's stupid. Don't be stupid. You Calvinists, you you think you're intellectual. You think you're philosophical. You're trying to figure out the, and the philosophy of Calvinism and believe in it. And then when we read the scriptures, it shows that it's actually stupid. So please, uh, open your eyes. Uh, pray. Pray and ask the Lord to open your eyes so that you can see the truth. These verses are so clear. Uh, now, let's see Curtis Hudson says next. Uh, Revelation 22:17. The last invitation in the Bible says, quote, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The water of life freely. It is, if it is true that no person has the ability to come to Christ, then why would Jesus say in John 5:40, Ye will not come to me? Why didn't he just simply say, you cannot come to me? Yeah. And then in Revelation it says, whosoever will, let him let him take the water of life freely. Yeah. Let me see. Um, Bill says, posted uh, Isaiah 118. God even desires to reason, and if man was incapable of doing it, so... He wouldn't have offered it freely. Oh, I think we already covered that, didn't we? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, Brother Bill, do you want to say anything about that Revelation verse? Uh, it says, whosoever will. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's, so, it's so obvious, you know, you know whosoever will. When, you know, it, it, it's even hard to, it's even hard to comment. You know, sometimes because it's so blatant and it's so obvious that that Christ is, is drawing all people unto Himself, and all can freely choose to come to Him. That you know, it, it just it, it it makes my mind explode. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's so, as you say, you, I think you got the word correct when you said so stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it defies the, the the heart of God Himself, desiring all men to be saved. It desires common sense and law. It defies every single thing, you know, it, it, you know, in the spiritual or in a natural world. It's just, it's just absolutely silliness. Yeah, uh, I think in the last show, uh, one of the things that we tried to prove and emphasize is that the philosophy of Calvinism is actually evil. So if you didn't see the last episode, go back and watch that. And I, I think it'll be real clear to you that this is an evil philosophy. Uh, and we wondered, how could someone, if they understand this, 
How could anybody embrace it? What does that say about that kind of individual that they would embrace such an evil philosophy? And now today what we're proving, I think, is that it is actually stupid. Scripture after scripture shows that, that it is wrong. As we go through TULIP, you'll see every single doctrine of Calvinism is not biblical. And therefore, Calvinists, don't be stupid. Okay? All right, let me see. Wayne posted, when the gospel is presented, the Holy Spirit enlightens the spirit of a man to see. This revelation is transmitted to the mind by the man's spirit so that man can make a decision to accept or reject the truth of the gospel. The mind cannot receive the gospel directly for it is foolishness to him. 1 Corinthians uh, and only by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the spirit of man, can the gospel be accepted. Okay, so we know that scriptures say that, that man, God desires for all of us to be saved. And it says that uh, the Holy Spirit draws us to Christ. And Jesus said, when I be lifted up, in that manner I will draw all men to myself. So we know that Jesus, the Spirit, is attracting man, he, we, he, but he's not imposing it. He's not forcing them to believe. He's attracting them so that they can understand. If they seek, they will find the truth, and then they can choose to believe or, or to, to reject it. Uh, whosoever will. Will you? It's not whosoever can. All right. All right, Brother Wayne. Uh, let's, see. let's see what my notes say. Whosoever, okay. Okay, go back to Curtis Hudson here. Um, the only thing that stands between the sinner and salvation is the sinner's will. God made every man, uh, God made every man a free moral agent, and God never burg burglarizes the human will. Uh, D.L. Moody addressed a large group of skeptics. To, he said, "I want to talk about the word word believe." the word receive, and the word take, unquote. When Mr. Moody had finished his sermon, he asked, now who will come and take Christ as Savior? One man stood and said, I can't. Mr. Moody wept and said, don't say I can't, say I won't. And then the man said, then I won't. But another man said, I will. Then another said, I will, and another said, I will, until scores came to trust Christ as Savior. Wow. I love stories like that. <laughs> Brother Bill, what do you think of that uh, little story by Curtis Hudson and Deal Moody? Oh, well, yeah, it's great. It just, it just shows you that even in reality, you know, without the, the stupidness of Calvinism away, in the real world, you know, where where the real God exists and real men with free will exist. You know, the offer there is open and the Holy Spirit, you know, draws all people. You know, we have a choice, you know. We can either say, I won't or I will. Not that I can't or I can. Yeah. You know, they've, they've, got it, they've got it all wrong, you know, Calvinists. I, I wasn't, if that's all right, we've got to talk. Another scripture that came to me I think is quite important. It is in Second Peter three nine. Is that, is that okay if I read that? Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's it. And this shows God because we were talking about God's heart earlier, you know. And it says the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men, you know, count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, which is the change of mind. Mm -hmm. So we see God's heart in there. He's not. He, he's Long suffering, he's not being slack, you know, he's not willing that a single soul perish, but he's, you know, want every single person, living creature, to change her mind and to come to Christ. It's so obvious, you know, it's, it, it, again, the mind boggles the, the, the Calvinistic God. You know, yeah. and, you know I, I've said this in one of my uh, other videos on Calvinism, is it, uh, we, we know that from a verse like that, that God wills or, or God desires that everybody gets saved. That's what God really wants. 
uh, but he gives us free will. He doesn't impose uh, his, his love on us because that would be raping us. So he, he, he loves us. He offers us this relationship with him, and we get to choose to embrace Jesus as our Savior or not. Uh, but if he was going to impose his, this on us, uh, be, because he desires everyone to come, wouldn't he just uh, impose it on everyone? We, I would have to conclude that if God is imposing salvation on people, and he desires everyone to get saved, then I'd have to conclude that there's universal salvation, that God, why would he just impose it on a handful of people when he could just as easily impose it on everybody? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I was going to make that, you've made the, the point I was just going to make. You know, if, you know if, if there was no free will involved, God could clearly have, you know, just clicked his fingers and every single soul, you know, would become robotic and they'd just automatically, you know, embrace Christ, you know, without, you know, with no volition at all. But, you know, he's given us that free choice and desires that, you know, we love him because we love him, you know, not because we're forced to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let me see. Oh, Wayne made a post here. Let's see what he says here. Uh, oh, yeah, I read that part. Uh, now he's got J-O-H. Uh, is that John 147 Jesus is it John <laughs> I don't know <laughs> oh, Jesus saw Nathaniel oh yeah okay it must be John Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said, saith of him behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile if the Lord said he was blessed how can uh, how can to be depraved Yes, good point, Bill. That's right. If uh, so, he yeah, and Jesus is saying that Nathaniel has an, an Israelite with no guile. That will will tell us that he doesn't have. Uh, he's not depraved in a way that he can't even believe. Um, let me see. Uh, Wayne posted Psalm thirty-two two. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. Yes. So we can see that uh, man is not uh, in a position to just not have an uh, uh, intelligence, not have reason, not have the ability to think and make a decision. Okay. Uh, now more from Curtis Hudson. Uh, Some Calvinists use John 6.44 in an effort to prove total inability. Here the Bible says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Um, but the Bible makes it plain in John 12.32 that Christ will draw all men unto himself. Here the Bible says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's a verse that I brought up earlier, and uh, Brother Bill, if, if you're still able to talk there, uh, t tell us, uh, on one hand, it says, no man can come unless the Father draw him, and then we see a follow-up verse a little bit later that Jesus says that, that he's going to draw all men. <laughs> well, this is it. This is the point you made earlier. You know, he, he desires that we all be saved, and he, desire, and he, and he draws all men out of himself, you know, so, you know, these two verses aren't contradictory to, to, to some who are using their brain, it's common sense that he's drawing all people into himself, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, as the point you just made in, in John 6 to 44, you know, no man can come except the Father drawn him, so it's logical that, that the Father is drawing all people, all men unto Christ, and it gets to the point where they have to make a choice. You know, that's to me that's common sense, and that's mm -hmm. what the two scriptures. If you put them to compare them, you know, a sign. You know, it's again it's ludicrous to, you know, what the what Calvinists do. They take the verse out of context, and then they ignore all the other verses which help to put it into its context. So you get the whole picture. 
and, and they seem to be experts at, at you know hiding these little things and, and you know contextually you know destroying scriptures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I really liked what, the way you said that it comes to a point where everybody must make a choice Be, because we know that that uh, God is drawing all men. The Holy Spirit is is trying to convince all men to come to Jesus, and everybody is going eventually get in a position where they're going to see the light and and say I I I want Jesus as my Savior, or they're going to see it and say oh, I'll do it some other way. I'll I'll join a religion. I'll I'll, I'll become a good person. And I'll I'll change my life. I'll repent of my sins. I'll do it. I don't need Jesus. So people. All people end up making that choice uh, because God is drawing them. They're forced to make a decision. You're gonna, you're gonna trust Jesus, or you're gonna put your faith in something else. I think that uh, the, the, that something else is, is in one way or another, is really self. The decision boils down to: Will you put your faith in Jesus as your Savior? Or are you going to believe in yourself? Are you going to believe in your own ability through practicing your religion or through doing something so that you can merit salvation? Do you think that's the case, or am I am I oversimplifying it, Bill? No, no, that you know that is that is the case. You know, it, it is to, to someone you know with a better common sense. You don't have to be an intellect or have a massive IQ. It is so obvious that the heart of Christ is to, to is to seek and to save all that is lost, to draw all people that He wants them to freely choose. It is so obvious, and you know perhaps these intellects that have stupefied themselves, you know, in their own dogmas and theologies. You know, they've, they've I don't know, they've, they've done something to their minds that, that I can't even comprehend because it's so it's so obvious. Yeah. And uh, Brother Wayne says, uh, posted, uh, no one will stand before God and say, I did not know. Um, another verse says that no, uh, no man will have an excuse uh, because God is drawing everyone. I think that's the reason no one will have an excuse and say, well, God, I didn't know about you. And God can say, well, I was drawing you the whole time. I was giving you signs. I was trying to attract you to, to me, and, and you just kept on tuning me out and rejecting me. You wouldn't listen. So uh, every man will be without excuse when they go to that judgment. Okay, more from Curtis Hudson here. Uh, before we go on to the next uh, the letter U, um, he says, So in the final analysis, men go to hell not because of their inability to come to Christ, but because they will not come to Christ. Ye will not come to me, that ye might have life, unquote. The teaching that men, women, and children are totally unable to come to Christ and trust Him as Savior is not a scriptural doctrine. The language itself is not scriptural. Those are the words of our great pastor, Dr. Curtis Hudson. Okay, um, are there any other verses do you want us to go through before we move on to the letter U? Do you have any more uh, verses that you think are uh, would be helpful here? There, I'm sure there are many, many more. Every verse that just, if you just do a, a word search on the word whosoever, <laughs> just look up whosoever. I don't know how many times it appears, but uh, most of those verses are making the same point that whosoever means that any person without exception has this choice to make. Believe it or not, I actually, you just mentioned that. I actually had, a, I think I've written it down how many times whosoever was mentioned. You know what? You know what that proves? You're a very smart man. You're a very, very smart man because you agreed with me. Yeah, but I can't even. I've read it down. I can't remember where I've read it, so I'm still on the look. Oh, uh, Wayne. Wayne just put it here. He says 162, 162 times. Uh, is that in the KJV, Wayne, or is it some other? So in the KJV, 162 times. Now my question is. It says whosoever 162 times. How many times in the KJV does it say, say the word sovereign? Zero times. 
zero times. So Calvinists are, are using this word sovereign, 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 God's sovereign, and yet the Bible never once says sovereign. It does say 160 times, whosoever though, come on Calvinists, put on your thinking caps, use your brain, don't be stupid. Okay, now we're going to go on to the letter U, you know, T-U-L-I-P. Um, oh, Bill got 183 references to it, so either 183 or 162 times, whosoever appears. Um, okay, uh, the next letter is U in TULIP, and it stands for unconditional election. Let me, let me read what it says about unconditional election. Uh, B. R. Lakin said that, quote, I believe in election. God voted for me, the devil voted against me, and now it's up to me to cast the deciding ballot. Amen. <laughs> yes, God wants everybody to be saved, the devil wants everybody to be lost, now the decision's up to every man and woman and child. Um, John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Uh, so, uh, the idea of unconditional election is simply that uh, uh, God chooses people to be saved, uh, and there are no conditions for it. It's not based upon uh, how good a person is, or how smart, or how much they know the Bible, or anything else. There's no criteria. It's a, a this, in in Calvinism they call it a mystery. Anytime something doesn't make any sense for a Calvinist, they can just say it's a mystery. Uh, so unconditional election is God chooses some people uh, unconditionally for some secret reason. It's a mystery. Uh, and yet we see scriptures. We're going to go through many scriptures that shows you there is a condition, and there is one condition. And I'm asked Brother Bill to make the point is what is this one condition? Well, the only condition is, and the way I always say it is, is you know, the, the classic one uh, with a Philippine jailer. You know, and, and then he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. End up. There's your condition. Well, wait, on... wait, a second. wait a second, Bill. I didn't, didn't the. Uh... Uh, didn't Paul say to the jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of all your sins and get water baptized? Oh, he might, yeah, and I think I think he might have even brought in some uh, deep wailing and, and flagellation on top of it. <laughs> you know, all these verses that simply say the, the only condition, there's one condition, that's believe on Jesus. Verse after verse after verse we could cite to prove this point. So if, if Paul said simply, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet there were other conditions, we would have to conclude that Paul must be a false uh, apostle, a false teacher, because he is negligent. There's more conditions, and yet Paul didn't tell them everything. He just told them that one thing. Oh, you mean it's that easy? All you've got to do is just believe on Jesus? Well, that's what Paul said. Well, was Paul negligent? Did he, did he just forget to tell the people all the other conditions or was Paul just telling us the truth it is that easy it is that simple believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved brother Bill yep yep it is it's that simple you know and this is what's the beauty this is why John's gospel is so beautiful you know always the condition there is believe 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 there's you know there's no strings attached you know there's nothing it's just just the simplicity of that of that childlike faith to, to believe on this Christ, mm -hmm. you know. And of course, you know when you are saved, you know when the Holy Spirit is come dwell inside you, you know He teaches you all things. So you you come to know, say, oh, I believed on Christ, but now I know this about Christ. Now I know He was mentioned in the Old Testament. Now I met, and you get revelation, you know, after you're saved in a lot of instances. So you don't have to have it all together, you know, intellectually understand every nook and cranny of the, of the Word of God, and then say, oh, okay, I believe it now. 
because you know not everybody's you know that intellectual not not everybody can read not everybody can write you know it has to be simple because God loves us and he and he wants to save us as simply and easily as possible that's that's how I see it mm, amen uh, I see that someone else has joined us and it may be a mystery to you but I believe this is uh, the uh, once saved, always saved Calvinist. Uh, is that correct, uh, brother? Actually, I'm the Osas Arminian. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. The once saved, okay, I'm sorry, I hate to insult you. I forgot how you, you termed that. The once saved, always saved Arminian, right? That's that's right. I got promoted to that title after last week. Yeah, and in case you don't recognize his voice, it's Brother Jackson. His his other channel is Mecha Wing Zero. And brother, could you explain to us what you mean by this? The O the OSAS Arminian. What what in the world is that? Okay, well, it's kind of a smart alecky name. I'll just be up front, because here's the thing: Calvinists like to say that everyone who doesn't agree with them is an Arminian. I actually watched this video, it's from a few years ago, but nonetheless they still keep repeating this and everything, that said easy believism is Arminianism. And he explained all the reasons why he thought easy believism, quote unquote, is Arminianism because they don't agree with all five points of Calvinism and then at the end he talked about eternal security saying yes most Arminians don't believe it but some throughout history have and I guess originally Arminianism when it was sort of a rebellion against Calvinism was neutral on the issue apparently and so therefore instead of having to call myself I'm not a Calvinist I'm not an Arminian which is what I've done for years I've decided to now call myself the OSAS Arminian so now I can't be um, I, I can't I can't, they, they can't complain and complain and point well you're an Arminian because I've already labeled myself as that you're muted Luke by the way okay yeah all right brother Jackson uh, OSAS Arminian um, I've often said that the uh, problem with Arminianism is that they, they do believe we, we have free will, but they believe that we can lose our salvation by either losing our faith or falling into sin or falling into some apostasy or something. They think you could lose your salvation. So um, the problem really is they don't believe in eternal security. And then the, we know the problem with, with Calvinism is even far worse in that all these things we're discussing today, all the things we discussed in the last show, we're seeing that the problem with Calvinism is just there's a mountain of, of uh, evidence against Calvinism. Uh, and yet Arminianism uh, is basically right, except they say you, you can lose your salvation. So Brother Jackson says, well, he's an Arminian, but he cures the one problem with Arminianism, and that is that he believes that once you're saved, you're always saved. You can never lose your salvation for any reason. So I think you got it right there, brother. Yeah, yeah I like. Um, I, I I know you said you were you were happy with things I was saying on the last show. So I guess that that that's me being promoted, almost like ah. finding finding the vampire killer whip in Castlevania. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, uh, you, you missed the beginning part of the show. We're going through TULIP. We've completed the, the topic of total depravity and total inability. And now we just started to talking about unconditional election. And, uh, and now we're trying to make the point that, well, Calvinists say that there's no condition. God just chooses people for no reason, uh, for no condition at all. And he forces them to get saved. He, he regenerates them. They get born again. And, and then they can believe, they can choose, choose to believe. Mike, I'll, I wanted to say this earlier when we're talking about how they have it backwards, that they think that a person gets regenerated, which means born again, uh, spiritually brought to life with the Holy Spirit indwelling them, and then they, then they can believe. But my point is uh, they don't even have to believe, do they? 
in Calvinism, you don't have to believe because you get regenerated. Once you're regenerated, you're indwelled, sealed with the Holy Spirit, and, and you never even believed yet. So mm -hmm. faith, faith is not even a requirement in Calvinism because God just, you're born again, and now you're saved, and you don't ever really have to believe, do you? Well, y they would say, of course, that you automatically will believe if you're uh, if you're saved, just like you automatically will serve him, as we're going to get to in the P of Tulip eventually. But let me just point something out that's related to this, and that's how c contradictory this term unconditional election is. Because here's the thing. If you say to a Calvinist that um, unconditional election or, 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 or is is God arbitrarily choosing things? They get very offended, and they um, they say, "No, of course it's it's to it's to do the glo it's for the glory of God." So really, there is a condition. It's who God um, thinks will bring the most glory to His kingdom, which is really in in their mind with the perseverance of the saints, pointing to works as being the condition. Really, so I really think even this term "unconditional election" is self-refuting. Well, I, I, I think that uh, the way you expressed it, it may be the way that uh, some people try to wiggle out of this unconditional election uh, and explain it away, but that's not really one of the doctrines. If you read uh, the, the um, uh, Westminster Confession, if you read the writings of Calvin, uh, you'll see that uh, that's not the way they express it at all, that the condition is wh whoever is going to bring the most glory uh, that's never mentioned in any of their theological writings. So, right. So, Historically, yes. Yeah. So if, you're hearing that, today. yeah. if you're hearing that today from some people, it's just a maybe a modern way to try to wiggle out of this because it seems so stupid that God wouldn't have any reason. So it, maybe this should be uh, TLIP. Instead of yeah. TULIP, it'll just be TLIP, T-L-I-P. There's... If they want to get rid of unconditional election the way you just described it, then it should be TLIP instead of TULIP. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing the thing is ab about it is it's very – it's it, really this idea of unconditional election, no matter how you slice it, that, that's the modern-day explanation by most Calvinists, such as James White and others. But okay. really there's – really there's – there's some condition no matter how you slice it. I guess the condition is that there is no condition in, in, in the historical context. And it's, just, it's a very weird thing to me. I always have, and I've never heard people yeah. really make this point of how self-refuting this is. Well, when, when we, uh, we went over some of the ancient writings of uh, Augustine and, and uh, Calvin last time, and, and uh, uh, they, they used the word mystery. Uh, it's because they they cannot explain any reason, so they said that you know it's just a mystery. You just have to just trust trust God that there is no reason, so it's a mystery. Um, but we're, what we're doing, Jackson, is uh, we're also going through uh, an article written by Kurt, Dr. Curtis Hudson on on Calvinism. Oh and yeah, yeah, I know which I think I know which article you're talking about. Is it why I disagree with all five points of Calvinism? Yes, it is, brother. You with your photographic memory. So, yeah, so, that's an article. Yeah, so right now we're. I'm going to start reading from his second point, unconditional election. So in Tulip, the letter, second letter two U stands for unconditional election. In other words, uh, God chooses people. He makes them saved uh, against their will. Their their will has no no, no uh, factor, and he saves them unconditionally. Now Curtis Hudson says by unconditional election Calvin meant that some are elected to heaven while others are elected to hell and that this election is unconditional it is wholly on uh, God's part and without condition by unconditional election Calvin meant that God has already decided who will be saved and who will be lost and the individual has absolutely nothing to do with it he can only hope that God has elected him for heaven and not for hell. This teaching is so obviously uh, so obviously disagrees with the oft-repeated invitations in the Bible to sinners to come to Christ and be saved that some readers will think that I have overstated the doctrine. So I will quote John Calvin in his Institutes book, uh, three, chapter twenty-three. Quote. 
Not all men are created with similar destiny, but eternal life is foreordained for some, and eternal damnation for others. Every man, therefore, being created for one or the other of those ends, we say he is predestined either to life or to death." Unquote. Uh, okay, we'll t discuss more of what Curtis Hudson says here, but let's get your reaction to that point right there. Uh, Brother, Brother Bill, you want to comment first on this? Well, only briefly that it just makes no sense. You know what, 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 you know what he says is this institutional religion. It, it just flies in the face of scripture every time. You know, and to, to, to and I just a lot of I really don't understand. I, I don't understand how they can come to these philosophical point because that's all it is really is it's a man-made philosophical point because it isn't it isn't scriptural at all and and I just really don't maybe I'm slightly Asperger's I don't know but I, my brain cannot deal with the, these stupid inane things they say when it flies completely in the face of, of what the, the the word of God clearly says it, you know it, it, it amazes me it absolutely amazes me mm -hmm. yeah um, so we're going to discuss a lot of verses, but uh, um, Brother uh, Curtis Hudson said all you got to do is just look at all the verses that we discussed. Some of them on the first point of total deprav total inability, and all these verses say that man does have the ability, and he is um, asked to choose. And so if, if if he's asked to choose, then how could you say that there's no condition? It just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, let me see. Uh, I'm glad I'm not the only one, Bill. Oh, okay. These guys have some posts going on here. Oh, private jokes. Private jokes. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, uh, Jackson, did you want yeah, to say these, these private jokes, just for the audience, this is a result of having Wayne in the, uh, in the hangout. He just forces us to have to make private jokes in the, in the chat because it's so much fun. Anyway... So the um, let let me also say this about about the the Calvinism and the the choosing and the ability. What I think this stems from is an unbiblical and illogical definition of what believing is. Um, they say that believing is a work. Oftentimes, that, that if you believe something, if you say man can believe the gospel, that's him working for his salvation because he's believing it and everything. Mm -hmm. The flaw with this with this logic is the fact that a work, by definition, is something that requires some form of effort, even if it's just a little bit of effort. But the thing is, believing is not a work at all because there's no effort involved unless the effort is that you're just, I guess researching everything and even then believing is not the work there it's, it, it's finding the evidence to come to the conclusion to believe in that case so really it's this unbiblical and illogical definition of what believe means or what what believing is because if they if they can say believing is a work then they say everybody has to be regenerated first in order to do it and therefore not of works lest any man should oh sorry not not in, in Ephesians 2 8 9 where it says it is the gift of God they think that it is faith rather than salvation it's not salvation is the gift of God faith itself is the gift of God and that that's the faulty logic behind this I believe you made two very good points that I want to respond to first of all Ephesians 2 8 9 and 10 uh, 2 8 9 particularly uh, when it talks about uh, for by grace are you saved so that we, we know that the subject is saved by grace you're saved we're talking about salvation uh, uh, but for by grace you're saved uh, through faith so faith is the vehicle faith, faith is the condition uh, not of yourselves uh, for, for by grace you saved through faith and this is not of yourselves this salvation is not of yourself. So it's not based upon personal merit. Um, uh, so it's not of yourselves, um, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, so yes, you're right, Jackson. They believe that the gift, 
You know, it's the gift of God, not of works. They believe that the gift is the faith. And we believe that the gift is salvation. And if you read... froze. For salvation. But this, this verse is saying, no, salvation is not of works. But if, 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 if uh, faith was the gift, then we'd have to say, it's not of works. What do, you mean, what do you mean? Faith is not of works? Well, we know faith is not of works because another verse, I don't know the address, but it says, um, to the man who worketh not, but believes in the one who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So this verse is saying here, to the man who worketh not, and, but his faith is counted as righteousness. So that's telling us right there that faith is not a work in that verse. Well, because here, let me also say this, is whether faith is a work or not even is really not the question. And let me explain what I mean. Because here's the thing. In 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 work, it's not definitely not a work in the Pauline sense for the reasons you just gave. I hope everyone was um, like everyone watching was listening carefully to what you said because that 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 was all totally true and a good a great point. But let me also say in John chapter um, six, I believe it's verse twenty nine. Uh, before that, the people were asking him, "What work do we do?" To um to inherit eternal life or to get eternal life, I forget the exact terminology that was used there. But Jesus says, "This is the work that you believe on the name of the Son of God, and that you may have life believing in His name." So really, whether believing is a work or not, it's the requirement. Um, yeah. But I, I, yes, I, I still agree you, with everything you said. You made a really good point, and I think in that verse, um, they're asking about work. And so Jesus uses the word work, but I think what he really means there, as you pointed out, is this is the requirement. This is what you must do. So, But he uses the word work because the people who asked the question were asking about works. Yes. So this, this, in this other words, what do we have to do? What, what works do we have to do to do the work of God? And he says, well, if you want to know what God requires, uh, believe on the, the one he sent. This yeah, is this, this is... This is John six twenty nine. Just so that, um, just so that, because I, I, you know, there's so many verses where it says believe in the Bible that it's easy to quote one, like I think I did instead of the one that was talking about. This is this is from the New King James, John six twenty nine. It says Jesus answered and said to them, "This is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He sent." So mm -hmm. that. So that's uh, that. That's what Jesus said. So, yeah. So um, it is the condition. It's the one condition, obviously. Uh, now, uh, let me see, uh, brother, brother Bill. Do you have anything to say about these points we've just been discussing here? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm agreeing. You know, it's a requirement for salvation is to believe. You know, some would say, oh, it's a work, and some wouldn't. But, you know, essentially it's not a work. Because when we when we speak of uh, works as in uh, re religious terms or, or Calvinistic terms, you know, their works are, are you know, uh, giving alms or making sure you bear much fruit or you go soul winning or you, you don't sin anymore and, and stuff like that. You know, that's what they see as works, you know, holy living and stuff. But in regard to it's not that sort of work in this sense you know what Christ is saying because he, he was being questioned only by the Jews and the Pharisees you know who are used to works and used to this and doing this and everything else and paying the tithes you know and so they came with that mindset already you know what is the work that we must do you know and they actually say works plural don't they in that verse mm -hmm. whereas Jesus said singular and, and, and in essence it's just to believe believe on you know just to believe so yeah. those I was expecting many, many works, make sure you pay more, you know, toy, make sure you give the priest more money and stuff like that. But clearly it was just simply to believe. So it's a different yeah. understanding of works between you know what a Calvinist see and, and, and what is actually 
you know, essentially the same in a sense. Well, we could we could uh, rephrase all this in Calvinistic terms here, and let's take uh, uh, Acts sixteen thirty one. Uh, uh, what must I do to be saved? In other words, what is the condition? What is the condition for me to be saved? And Paul says, this is the condition. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When uh, Jesus was asked by these Pharisees, uh, what are the conditions that God requires of us? Jesus is saying, this is the condition. Believe on the one he sent. So um, that's really the important thing to understand from all these verses is that there is a condition. Calvinists say there's no condition. It's unconditional. God just... Some people he saves them, and they don't even they probably don't even know they're saved. They're they're saved and don't even know it until they eventually believe, and then they think, well, I must be elect. <laughs> I must have been chosen. Uh, but uh, we see from all these things that there is a condition. Um, let's see what Curtis Hudson says says next about this. Um, Uh, this teaching is obviously uh, oh wait. not a mel not all men are created with similar death oh I think he already quoted that so Calvinism teaches that it is God's own choice that some people are to be damned forever he never intended to save them he foreordained them to hell and when he offers salvation in the Bible he does not really offer it to those those who were foreordained to be damned it is offered only to those who were foreordained to be saved. This teaching insists that we need not try to win men to Christ because men cannot be saved unless God has planned for them to be saved. And if God has planned for them to be eternally lost, they will not come to Christ. So there's two important points that he's making here. One, he's talking about witnessing, and then he's, he's also talking about the fact that people, uh, God actually is just creating some people just so he can torture them in hell and creating other people so he could uh, give them eternal life in heaven. So let me ask you to respond to that. Uh, Brother Jackson? The problem with, um, the, problem with the Calvinistic uh, logic here about creating some people for the lake of fire and others for paradise and whatnot is really it's the same flawed logic that we talked about last week about God causing evil and whatnot. Because what they say here is God needs to show us all of his attributes and therefore for holiness he has to create this bad thing as well which doesn't make any sense because the whole point of the Christian God is that he's all good. He's not partially evil like, the, like I believe the Muslims believe about Allah. But the thing is the idea that, that that that's the flaw behind the behind the logic behind it. Now, logic aside, that's a really really disgusting uh, God, in my opinion. I'm not going to give you the ability to believe, but I'm going to give him the ability to believe. It's like it really. It's like the epitome of picking favorites on an eternal grand uh, scale. Yeah. And uh, before you joined us, Jackson, we I cited the verse that uh, uh, God uh, is uh, not uh, is long suffering. He's not slack in his promise. Uh, he he's uh, long suffering. He doesn't desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if God wants everyone to be saved, uh, and he and then God is going to choose people, then he would choose everyone. This would we would have to have a logical conclusion. You know, uh, uh, it's just deductive logic that if he wants everyone to be saved and he, God's the one that chooses, then he would actually choose everybody. We'd have to be universalists. Uh, because if God loves everyone, he's going to choose everyone. Of course, they don't, Calvinists don't believe that God loves everyone either, do they? No. I think I already told last week the story of meeting this Calvinist on my campus and whatnot, and he was like it was kind of disturbing he was like almost giddy to tell me that God doesn't love everyone like he just he loved the concept of people of God not loving everyone and whatnot and made that point to me really vehemently yeah uh, I think as we go through all almost all these points of tulip that they, they really are all interconnected they're kind of like uh, uh, 
a glove. You know, it has five fingers on it, and they're all part, they all make up the glove. It wouldn't be a glove if it didn't have the five fingers. And the uh, but the really the whole glove stands for one thing, and 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 that is what we talked about in the first show is that God does not give us free will. He's going to save some people uh, with with them having nothing to say about it, and then the vast majority of others he's going to he's going to just torture them in hell, and then uh, they don't have anything to say about it. And we have concluded that that's not the God of the Bible. That sounds more like the devil, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as we go through this, I mean, we, we really beat this horse to death in the first episode, showing that this God of Calvinism is evil. And this philosophy of Calvinism is evil. And uh, so we won't go over that too much at three of these points because we covered it so thoroughly last time. Bill, you want to say something on this before I talk more about Curtis Hudson's comments? The yeah, only the, the original intent of, of hell in the first place was, you know, to, to, to put the, the angels that rebelled against God in. You know, God never intended ever that, that mankind should should go there. You know, it's because of the fall, you know, and all these problems. And it's also worth noting that as soon as the fall started, that God already put in place a plan to save and redeem mankind. So it, it's nonsense to say that that God pre-elected some people to go into hell that he already designed just for the fallen angels. That That's a nonsense just, just there. Yeah. You know, without even, without even going into depth of, you know, the scriptures, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just there <laughs> for us. Exactly. Okay, let me see what I, the verses I have here in my notes here. Uh, okay, we talked about John 3.18. The condition is to believe. Uh, he that believeth not is condemned. He that believes in the name of the Son of God is saved. But John 3.36 says the same kind of thing. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So we're seeing in these verses here clearly stated that there is a condition, and the condition is you must believe. But Calvinists, you know, they think you're regenerated, you're 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 quickened, your spirit's brought to life, and the and the scriptures say that the condition to be saved Christian is you are in, must be indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Everyone who has the Spirit is is a Christian. So the Calvinists have we'd have to conclude that uh, they're Christians even before they believe. And uh, but this is saying no, we we have to believe to have everlasting life. So this is saying, no, oh, the condition is believing, not... Uh, now, do you want to say anything about that, Jackson, before I read more of Curtis Hudson's comments? Um, I think you pretty much said anything, everything I was going to say right there, so why don't you read this next comments? Okay, okay so Calvinism teaches that it is God's own choice that some people... Are, oh, I read that. Uh, this teaching insists that we need to try... Oh, yeah, what about... We, we neglected this. What about soul winning? Um, if man does not have a free will and he can't choose, if if the, God's going to save people and for no condition at all, then um, why why do you ever witness to anybody? What's the point? I well, guess. Or, or go ahead, go Jackson. Get ready. I was just going to make a real brief comment. I guess the only thing that they could say is this is God's methodology of getting more elect people is me witnessing or something like that. But really even that doesn't hold up because if, if God elected them that means they'll get saved no matter what since it's not possible to escape the will of God. So I guess if you're a Calvinist and you're doing it anyway you'd have to go around saying like Luke you might be chosen. There's a very slim chance that Jesus died for you and loves you. He probably hates you and created you for the lake of fire. But for all I know, there could be a real slim chance that God chose you and died for you. And if that's the case, you won't be able to resist what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the irresistible grace and then unconditional election kind of go together. But the... Uh, um, Bill, let me ask you to comment on, on that. Why, why witness if you were a Calvinist? Well, to be honest, it's absolutely pointless to witness because the elect, according to them, would just come flooding the churches anyway, wouldn't it? Absolute waste of time, that'd be. You know, I suppose the only reason 
you know, I think uh, Jackson was hinting towards that, would be, I suppose, that they'd go out soul winning just to prove they are elect anyway. Uh, you know, otherwise it's, it's pointless because the elect are going to be the elect and they're going to be saved whatever happens. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's circular reason. It's just that it's inane. You know, there'd be no point in, in soul winning at all if God has already determined which ones are going to be saved or not. You might as well just, you know, sit home and smoke a pipe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, I made a short video uh, titled "If I If I Was a Calvinist," and one of the points I made in that video is I would never witness. I wouldn't do any uh, preaching and tell people about Jesus. There, there's no point. And uh, whoever's going to be saved, it's already established, and uh, God's already decided. And so, so why do I have to put any effort in? I might as well just go out and play golf instead. Okay, Brother Wayne posted something here. Let's see, Romans 10, 14, and 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear it without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So here in many, in many verses in the scriptures like these, it's, it's telling us the need for evangelism, the need for us to share the good news, and yet there's no logical reason to do it if you're a Calvinist. Okay, uh, I'll read more unless Jackson, you want to say something else before I go on? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, he says there is the, there is the Bible doctrine of God's foreknowledge, predestination, and election. Most knowledgeable Christians agree that God has His controlling hand on the affairs of men. If uh, they agree that according to the Bible, He selects individuals like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David as instruments to do certain things He has planned, most Christians agree that God may choose a nation, particularly that He did cho uh, did choose uh, Israel through which he gave the law, the prophets, and eventually through whom the Savior himself would come, and that there is a Bible doctrine that God foreknows all things. Uh, now, uh, before I read his conclusion on that, let me get your reaction to, to that. Okay. Brother Bill, you still with us? Okay. Okay, yeah, go, ahead. Com go ahead and comment if you, if you want. Yeah. Well, that's right. It's bang on. It's bang on. You know, absolutely bang on. You know, and I'm in the same mind as you. You know, it doesn't. It makes no sense, does it? Un, you know, unconditional election, in essence, makes no sense. And I think you know, Brother Curtis is making some excellent points. Absolutely excellent points. You know, I suppose in that sense, you know, God has blessed us. You know, with, with, with brothers like that who who had this. You know this this common sense approach, this good scriptural, you know, grounding that that you know helped us along. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, Curtis Hudson uses these terms here, and Calvinists, I think, misuse these terms. The terms foreknowledge, predestination, election, and then also uh, he he says that he chooses certain individuals and nations to to accomplish certain things. So. Um, my question is, um, what's the proper way of understanding these terms? You got foreknowledge, predestination, election, and then also uh, the choosing of Israel, the choosing of Abraham. Jackson, you want to go first? Sure. Um, well, for, I'll start with the first term I believe you mentioned, which is foreknowledge. Th this one really is kind of amazing to me that they that they twist this one so much because what foreknowledge means is knowing something in advance. It has nothing to do with causing something necessarily. You know, it means knowing the future, which I do believe God knows the future. The fact that He knows somebody is not going to be saved does not mean that He made that person not be saved. I don't see how, how those logic or how those two things can logically go together necessarily as Calvinists would have us believe. Um, 
as far as the election of Abraham and Israel and, and, and all that stuff, you know, we're not denying that God doesn't have special plans for, for certain people. That's a lot different, though, than saying that he chooses people to hate and create for the lake of fire, that, rather than saying, you know, for Abraham I have a special purpose, or for Israel I have a special purpose. It just it seems like two totally different things to me. Yeah. Uh, I have a really good video on my playlist, uh, Calvinism Debunked, talking about election. And he proves that the election never applies to salvation to an individual. Election always applies to um, usually it's Israel or Israelites who he chose to do certain things. These are examples, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, uh, the uh, God uh, chose them. They were elected to accomplish a certain thing. God used them. Uh, God elected Paul, I think, for his uh, special ministry. And um, but it's people think that election and the choosing is God's choosing and electing people for salvation. But really, there's no example of that in the scriptures where uh, it, those words are used for individual salvation. And I'm not going to try to go through the whole proof of that. Just watch the video on my playlist uh, titled "Election." Um, Bill, you want to say something before I read more of Curtis? Are we, are we still on the same theme? Unconditional election, are we? Yes, yes, we are. Yeah, uh, Curtis may mention it, but if he doesn't, you know, if we get time, you know, two of my favourite verses and two verses that, that absolutely destroy, you know, unconditional election would be Titus 2.11 and 1 Timothy 4.10. So if we get time later, it'd be good to read them out. Uh, if you have them handy, go ahead and read them to us. Yep, yep, I've got them ready, yep. Okay. So I think we, we did mention these briefly last week, but it's always good to keep, mm -hmm. you know, re-mentioning these scriptures because they're so, so far. So 1 Timothy 4.10 says, For therefore we both labour and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is Saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. So that proves that, you know, that Christ died for all men. And the ones who believe, you know, receive salvation. And Titus 2.11, you know, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared to all men, not just some men or a select few, it's to all men this, 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 you know, gracious salvation has appeared to. But mm -hmm. carry on in Luke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, that refutes unconditional election and it also refutes the limited atonement uh, points. Um, second Peter, uh, second Peter one ten. I think, yeah. I think uh, Curtis has talked about that here. Uh, now, uh, Curtis Hudson says, uh, uh, um, uh, I have in my hand a booklet entitled Tulip, written by Vic Lockman. This, this is Curtis Hudson writing says, in the booklet, Mr. Lockman attempts to prove the five points of Calvinism. Under the point unconditional election, he quotes Ephesians 1.4, but he only quotes the first part of the verse. Quote, he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, unquote. However, that is not the end of the verse. Mr. Lockman, like most Calvinists, stopped in the middle of the verse. The entire verse reads, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The, the verse says nothing about being chosen for heaven or hell. It says we are chosen that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Under the same point, unconditional election, Mr. Lockman quotes John 15, uh, verse 16, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Again, Mr. Lockman, like most Calvinists, stops in the middle of the verse. The entire verse reads, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should uh, go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, uh, he may give it to you. The verse says nothing about being chosen for heaven or hell. It says we are chosen to go and bring forth fruit, that, uh, which simply means that every Christian is chosen to be a soul winner. The fruit of a Christian is another is other Christians. 
Proverbs 11.30 says, quote, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Okay, that's quite a bit of good stuff he's just said there. So let me ask uh, Jackson, if you're ready, go ahead and comment on what he said. I think that uh, Dr. Hudson is essentially correct. I think that there's probably other types of fruit besides evangelism as well that could also be in view like um you know helping people with other things or ser being a servant in other ways but yeah that uh, other than that i think i i agree with everything he said there yeah uh yeah we know that there's the, the fruit of the spirit and there's a lot of things listed in, that, in there but uh, uh one of the things that i've uh, is very commonly misused when it talks about uh you will know them by their fruit uh people think that that a, a Christian is determined by how many good works and how much their life changes, but it's talking about false teachers. Uh, and, and so you'll know a false teacher by their fruit. And what is the fruit? And in this case, it, it's what Curtis Hudson is talking about. The fruit of a false teacher are false converts. Right, and false teachings and everything. Yeah. The fruit of a, a, a true teacher will be real converts, and real uh, accurate doctrine. Yeah. So, Brother, brother Bill, what do you have to say about all this? Yeah, I was actually going to agree, agree with your point entirely there, because as soon as you were speaking, that straight into my mind came Proverbs eleven thirty, uh -huh. and that is, you know, and that even says mentions the fruit. It says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and that he that winneth souls is wise. So we we already know from the proverbs that the barren fruit that Jesus desires. Is to is to make more Christians, you know. A bad tree would produce non-Christians, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and a good tree would produce Christians. So you know, so we know that this fruit that needs bearing is that Christians beget Christians who beget Christians. You know, and, and that and that is how you know evangelism and proselytization is done. You know, by bearing the, the, the fruit of evangelism. That's how I see it. Yeah. And uh, that's why I'm an evangelist. I mean, of, of all the things that I could use to describe myself in my ministry, the word I would use is evangelist because that's what I focus on. That's what I think is most important. The most valuable thing for me to do is not feed the homeless, clothe the homeless, do all these things, all these charitable things, and then they go to hell. No. My, the most valuable right. thing is getting someone to get the gift of eternal life. And then, you know, you can feed them and clothe and all that, but, but if, you, if you do all those other things, but you neglect evangelism, what favor have you really done them? If they, they just go to hell because you neglected this most important mission of evangelism. Jackson? I agree. I agree entirely. I'm just, I, the only thing is... Um... That's not to belittle, I know you don't mean it this way, all the Christians who have done great charity work with soup kitchens and whatnot and everything like that, but our goal should always be an outreach of, of evangelism. Yeah, uh, you're correct. I wasn't didn't mean it that way. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, rescue mission here in Las Vegas, I preached there, and, and uh, they have a really good, you know, they feed people, they help people, they house people, but they also have a, 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 a every day a, a, a church service and, and a, you know, uh, invitation to get saved. So, you know, they, they might attract the people there with food, just like, you know, Jesus, you know, he, the people came to get fed, but, he, you know, he, he, he wanted more than just feeding them fish and, and loaves, you know, he wanted to feed them the, the uh, living water and the, the bread of life. Brother Bill? Yep, yep, spot on, yeah, yeah, and like I said, Jackson's made a point as well. It's, we're not you know, negating the fact that, that, that God cares and wants us to show our love to be manifest in, in these good things, you know, feeding the poor and, you know, and stuff like that. But essentially, you know, in terms of what is most important, you know, it's always better to, to get a soul saved than a, than, a, than a stomach, you know, filled. You know, both are... Both, I believe, are good, honourable things. You know, and as Christians, we ought to show the love of Christ and do these things. But essentially, at the end of the day, it, it's the souls that matter. That's yeah. eternal. Yeah. Yeah. 
I will say something that supports Jackson's uh, point about uh, I, I, we shouldn't uh, belittle and, and uh, neglect the other things, but because I saw in a church once it said, uh, um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Uh huh. People don't care how much you know. I mean, you could dazzle them with all the scriptures and your, all your knowledge of scriptures, and they might not care, uh, uh, care about all that knowledge, but when you show them how much you uh, you care, maybe by feeding them and helping them and caring for them and loving them, then then they may be interested in what you know and want to listen. Okay, um, next point of Curtis Hudson is uh, nowhere does the Bible teach that God wills for some to go to heaven and wills others to go to hell. No, the Bible teaches that God would have all men to be saved. 2 Peter 3.9 says that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2.4 says, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Those who teach that God would only have some uh, to be saved, while he would have others to be lost, are misrepresenting God, God and the Bible. Uh, and his final point is, does God really predestinate some people to be saved and predestinate others to go to hell so that they have no free choice? Absolutely not. Nobody is predestined to be saved except as he choose, chooses of his own free will to come to Christ and trust him for salvation. And no one is predestined to go to hell except as he chooses of his own free will to reject Christ and refuses to trust him as Savior. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Nothing could be plainer. The man who goes to heaven uh, goes because he comes to Jesus and trusts him as Savior, and the man who goes to hell does so because he, he refuses to come to Jesus and will not trust him as Savior. So that is the condition. It's not unconditional election. It is one condition, and that is you believe on Jesus for your salvation. Okay, Jackson. That's um, that's what we've been trying to harp on and trying to say for years now. When talking to Calvinists and everything, that um, that the condition is faith. You know, it, it condition is faith. God wants to save all people, and the only way I can see that somebody could disagree with what um, with what. Curtis Hudson said there is if they've got these strange theological glasses to say all doesn't really mean everybody well none, none should perish really means all of the elect he doesn't want and that kind of thing mm-hmm okay um, all right we're, we're gonna be finished with the you in tulip but Bill do you have any final thing to say before I move on here no, I think we've we've done a, a grand job destroying unconditional election and we hope and pray that people are grasping it yes I do too it's it's so obvious if they just open up their eyes and see okay so now we go to the L of tulip limited atonement but dr. Hudson says by limited atonement Calvin meant that Christ died only for the elect for those he planned and ordained to go to heaven he did not die for those he, uh, he planned and ordained to go to hell. Again, I say, such language is not in the Bible, and the doctrine wholly contradicts many, many plain scriptures. For, for instance, the Bible says in 1 John 2, 2, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The teaching of Calvinism on limited atonement contradicts the express statement of Scripture. For First Timothy two uh, verses five and six says, "The man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all." Okay, so um, first let's talk about what does limited atonement actually mean, Jackson. Limited atonement is the doctrine, and it, it, like all these others, sometimes people will phrase it slightly differently and whatnot, but it's the doctrine that Jesus only died for the elect, for, for those he chose to go to heaven. He did not die for the sins of every person throughout history, like 
an unbiased reading of the Bible will conclude. One verse that I think really does deny this doctrine and really destroys it is Second uh, Peter 2 1 which says what the false prophets among the people just as there will also be false teachers among you who secretly introduce destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them bringing swift destructions upon themselves. Now what the Calvinist has to say is that kind of bought does not mean the atonement which seems, and it's true that a few times in, in other scriptures, like the Old Testament and whatnot, bought doesn't mean, like, like, like talking about some kind of physical salvation or something. But think about how absurd that is in this context, denying the Lord who physically delivered them right there. I mean, that doesn't make any sense, and I don't see how an unbiased person could come to that conclusion in Second Peter 2.1 here. Yeah, I think that's a great verse. We have a lot of verses in this uh, subject that we're, we're going to be referring to, but to make a more clear uh, explanation of why this contradicts this verse contradicts uh, a limited atonement. Uh, it, first, who is it, who is it talking about? What group of people? And then you, the next part says uh, whom whom he bought. Who are the people that it's referring to? Well, I posted the, the the link in the chat just so you can see what I'm what I'm saying again. But it says, "But the false prophets." So he's talking about the false prophets, also among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing strict destruction on themselves. So it's the false prophets. It's these wicked people who he bought. Mm -hmm. So we know that they are not uh, saved people, uh, and they're not what Calvinists would call elect people, uh, yeah. they, because it says they're false teachers uh, and bringing in uh, destructive heresies, and it says that they will have swift destruction. So these are all describing a lost person, and, they're, and, and yet it says that, that he bought them. Now, bought them is a term when we, there's other scriptures that says that we were bought with a price. We were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, uh, Jesus paid with his blood even for these false teachers, for everyone. Bill, what do you want to say about that? Well, yeah, just as she, as she was talking about that, just Hebrews 2 9 come up. And that's one verse that you cannot dispute because at the end it says, you know, talking about Jesus. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, right? For he suffereth of death, crowned with glory, honor, all right? That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That's not even whosoever. That's not even, that is literally clear, every man. And you, you, you can't escape it. You cannot escape it. You know, this, this you know, blessed atonement, it was 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 not limited to a few select few. It's for every single man, and and you know even one drop of Christ's precious blood would be enough to to eradicate sin entirely. So to yeah, say that, yeah. that that atonement is limited for a few, you know, it, it, to me is is the one that really really gets me you know angry. Yeah. What was the address for that verse again? That that's Hebrews two nine. Hebrews 2 9. So, everybody, read that verse, study that verse, and you'll see that, uh, yes, uh, Jesus shed his blood for every man. And that means every. mankind, all of humanity, all man, women, child, uh, all, of all races, of all nationalities, every man, every person. Okay, that was a good one. Um, now, let's see more what Curtis Hudson says. Um, Oh, oh, let's talk more about this First John 2.2. 2. He's a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Um, and, he, and Jesus gave his, ran, his life as a ransom for all. Let's discuss those because those are very important to, to you know, break down a little bit. Uh, so he says he's a propitiation for our sins. And, and uh, in this, he's talking to the, the believers. And he says, and not for ours only, it's not just for the believer's sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. So here is another example of saying the, a distinction. There's two groups of people. Our sins are the believers, and then the whole world means everybody else in the world, who, who, even if they don't believe. 
He is the propitiation for our sins. Now, propitiation means it's a satisfactory payment. He, his payment was satisfactory. It, it completed it, uh, the, 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 uh, the task of paying for our sins in full. Okay, so do you want to say something about uh, those verses there before we move on? Jackson? Um, you know, the, the, the problem with, with the limited atonement doctrine is it applies, it applies logic that's really not in the scriptures and in fact is contradicted by what you just read and other things. What they would say is, well, you're saying he paid for all sins. If he paid for them, that must mean that everybody's going to be saved. Like I heard this, this Calvinist I met on campus say that. But the problem is that's just not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that a payment for sin automatically forces someone to accept the payment and believe and be saved and everything. So I just thought I'd tack that on to the already excellent point well, you made about those verses. I think, I think you brought up an interesting point, and I'm not even sure that everybody on the panel uh, is going to agree on this, but um, I, I'm going to bring it up anyway. It, the, uh, so we know that Jesus paid for everybody's sins, and I preach all the time. I said, look, sin is not the issue. Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world. Your sins are paid for. Your sins are forgiven right now. The only issue right now is life. Since he paid for your sins, now you're free to come to him for life life everlasting. If you put your faith in him, understand he paid for your sins on the cross. He raised himself from the dead, proving he does have life. He's offering you life right now. And uh, so I believe that everybody's sins are forgiven. Now someone else might say he paid for everybody's sins, but it's not effectual for them until they put believe in him. And that these are two schools of thought. That that uh, and I'm saying that no, it's already effectual. Sins are no no longer an issue. Even for a Muslim or an atheist, their sins are paid for already. The only issue that remains now is not sin; it's the Son. What will you do with the Son of God? And then someone else would say, well, even though He paid for their sins, it doesn't really accomplish anything for them unless they they believe. Uh, how do you guys see that? There's two schools of thought. I'm with a school of thought because when I preach, I preach exactly that. You know, I tell people the truth. If you look through the scriptures, it is clear that it's, it's no longer a sin issue. It is a son issue. You know, if Christ, you know, where, where John declares, you know, you behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So the sin issue has been taken away. has been dealt with. It's now an issue of the son. If you have the son, you have life. If you don't have the son, you don't. It's that simple. So yeah, I'm in agreement with there that the, the the sin has been dealt with. Now we now we have to confront the son. Do we accept the son or do we reject the son? So, yes, yeah, okay. All right, brother, you're in agreement with me on that. And yet I know a lot of other people. I I think Jackson might see it differently. But uh, Jackson, I personally do see it differently and it's not because you and Bill's logic doesn't make sense to me. It does, but I, I don't know how that can reconcile certain verses like Jesus saying that unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And in Revelation saying that, um, that, that they will be judged by, by their works and whatnot. So that would be an interesting discussion for another time. At this point, not because I don't understand the logic, but because of what I see in the scripture, I think I personally am in the other camp, but that's okay. We can uh, we don't have to agree 100% on everything. We don't have to be dogmatic, but I think that I personally am in that camp. Yeah. Okay, brother. Uh, brother Wayne, do you have a, a take a stand on this? Uh, let me see what he said here in his comment. If Jesus did not die for the sins of the whole world, then God is not fair to all of mankind. He would be unjust by doing something for some, but not for others. But that contradicts many scriptures. That's true. Uh, do you have a, uh, uh, Brother Wayne, uh, do you see the, the, uh, the two sides of this uh, discussion here, and uh, Brother Jackson and uh, his viewpoint versus uh, Bill's and mine, do you fall on one side or the other on that? We'll wait for, for Wayne's uh, answer here. Yeah, th this is an interesting discussion. Maybe we can have another 
uh, show where we really compare these two sides and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can see Wayne busy. Amen, brother. Second, oh, Bill did that. They're both busy typing. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to quote just a, another one, which is a uh, good one. Read that yeah. one. Too. What we're Speak waiting on. for, Wayne's call. Oh, wait. Okay, Wayne says I can see both sides, but I would go with you and Bill. Okay, so uh, Jackson's the minority viewpoint, but you know the minority is sometimes right. Look, the majority of the world are not even saved. So you can't just say the majority says one thing, therefore they must be right. So maybe Jackson's right. We'll see. Uh, Bill says to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed them to us the word uh, of reconciliation. Yeah. But I can see yeah, there's a lot of verses uh, that support our viewpoint, and then Jackson pointed out a couple of verses that we'd have to deal with and see see how we can uh, understand those. Okay, let's let's move on here. But I'm happy that I'm associated with brothers uh, that uh, uh, we can't disagree on something and uh, we still love each other. We don't have to agree on everything. Uh, now, uh, this is. Okay, the Bible teaches that Jesus is the Savior of the world. John 4, 42 and says, and, quote, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world, unquote. Again, in John 4, 14, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, unquote. The scriptures make it plain that Jesus came to save the world. John 3.17, for God sent his son uh, into the world, for, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the, the, but the world through him might be saved. John 3.16, of course, too. But uh, the problem here, I mean, we can see this as clearly, <laughs> this is so obvious to us because we're not stupid. But, but Calvinists, every time the word world appears, what did they do with it, Jackson? They try to make it mean something it doesn't mean. Like, well, it means really just select people from all different ethnicities or different nations and whatnot. And I, I, I don't know how you would get that without theological glasses reading that verse. Yeah, and what would the, what would you call that that, that type of uh, you know interpretation? What is you refer to that those two terms last time? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's not exegesis, but eisegesis. Yeah, in other words, when we read the verse, it's obvious to everybody what all these verses mean. But if if uh, we so we're using exegesis, we're we're taking out of the scriptures and making our conclusions based on what the scriptures tell us. But eisegesis, the Calvinist has to do eisegesis and say, no, uh, world doesn't really mean world because in Calvinism. Not, not everybody in the world is elect, therefore the world has to mean something else to conform to Calvinism, so the world just means different nations and not just Israel. Okay, that's, that's an example of, uh, uh, you know, this, another stupidity of Calvinism, the twisting of the scriptures. Okay, so, um, uh, let me see. Uh, no man will ever look at Jesus Christ and say, quote, you didn't want to be my savior, unquote. <laughs> oh, man, that's good, brothers. No, no, Jesus wants to be the savior of all men. As a matter of fact, 1 Timothy 4.10 says, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. This is not, again got to be one of the biggest problem verses for a Calvinist. How are they going to twist that scripture? I mean, first of all, what does it what does it mean, uh, Jackson? Uh, is, you have that verse in front of you. Uh, which which one are you talking about exactly? First Timothy four ten. Uh, I'll see if I can copy it and put it in there. Is that, is that he's the savior of all men, especially to them that believe? Yeah, right, right. Okay, you know what? I actually, it's kind of funny you bring that one up 
because the um, I saw I saw a video by this Calvinist about this verse, and he said what it means is that he's the physical savior of all men, and just it just keeps him alive. Oh, I can physically. see that. Yeah, I can see that because it says. Yeah. Therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach for the, those who will be physically saved. Yeah. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. <laughs> it doesn't exactly. say that. Exactly. Well, well, I think, oh, Luke, you need, to look at it, you, look at, you need to look at it more carefully because we all know the term Savior is always about physical salvation, right? Yeah, I mean, I, it looks <laughs> to me like the Calvinists have inserted that idea into the verse. How could they do that? Have you have you ever met a Calvinist? <laughs> oh man, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, Bill, what do you say about that verse? I, it's one. No, it's one of my favourite. It's, it, it's a it's a it's a Calvinistic killer verse. You know, because that that tells you that clearly he's saviour of all men. All right, that is he atoned for every single creature, and especially for those who believe. So it avails the ones who believe. But obviously, the payment has been made for every single creature anyway. You know, so, and, and I, I tied that in to, I put a little post on there, Colossians 1.20. And that says, having made peace through, you know, the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. You know, whether they're in heaven or on earth. You know, that's how massive God's reconciliation was, and how, how powerful and potent, you know, his, his blood was. Yeah, and, and the, as you just said, one Timothy four ten, to me yeah. is the killer verse. That that you know, I, I I just thought of a good idea for Calvinists. I think Calvinists ought uh, uh, actually publish a new dictionary, and and they they should tell us what uh, these words mean. All doesn't really mean all. Whosoever doesn't mean whosoever. All men doesn't mean all men. And world doesn't really mean world. They, they need to uh, write their own dictionary. and uh, Or maybe they could do what the Jehovah Witnesses did by writing their own Bible, that New World Translation, where they, they tried to put their own theology into the Bible by rewriting it. Maybe Calvinists should do that. What do you think? It would be well, helpful. Yeah. They need to, don't they? Because <laughs> the average human being with a brain that works can see right through them. Now let me let me bring this up just so that we're thorough in covering this verse of of 1 Timothy 4:10. One Calvinist said that it can't mean I mean this is this is ridiculous but I I still need to say it just so we can respond to this. It can't mean that he's the the eternal savior of of all men especially them that believe because that would mean everyone is saved and especially denotes a special kind like he has a special type of looking out physically for his elect and everything so yeah. um so what what d does this verse allude to universalism i'd love to get your you, you and bill's response to that bill you well, want to go first yeah, yeah well yeah sure. no it doesn't no because it says especially of those that believe so the way it's clear it says, you know, his atonement paid for every creature, but it will only avail for those who believe. You know, that's what's broken, you can see there, can't you? You know, yeah. you trust the living God who is saviour of all men, comma, especially of those that believe. <laughs> so common sense and logic would dictate that, yeah, he's paid for all the sins of the world, but it's only going to avail those who actually believe it, who put their trust in it. Well, yeah, I, I agree, and I, I think that uh, uh, the the first part is is referencing to the fact that uh, he's the he's, he's the savior of all men in the fact that he paid for everybody's sins, so sin is no longer an issue between all men and God. Every man is free to come to God because Jesus served his purpose as savior from the from sin. They're, they don't have to worry about the sin debt because Jesus paid for it. So he saved them from the sin debt. But those of us who put our faith in Jesus, are we're really special. Because we not only have our sin debt paid for, but we put our faith in him. So now he's given us life everlasting. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. You know what's interesting is this is probably the only verse I know of 
that the Calvinist admitted that all men meant everyone universally. So really, in their dictionary or their translation, they also have to include a star saying, if the letters, or sorry, if the reference is 1 Timothy 4.10, consult the regular dictionary. <laughs> yes, well, uh, what's that? Uh, well, what a tangled web they weave when at first they practice to deceive. I was just going to just mention, Luke, you know, this is not serious, but... You know, we're finding it quite amusing that that verse we're actually calling the unicorn A-bomb verse. Yeah. It destroys, it destroys yeah. Calvinism straight away. Yep, yep. Oh, the unicorn A-bomb verse, huh? Yeah. Well, and see, just for the audience who's watching this so they don't think that we're high or something, is... um. My point about a white unicorn being that absurd, we, we now have sort of a spin-off of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, called the Unicorns, where we all pick a color, and it's an inside joke that's running, and the unicorn's enemy are the Calvos, according to Bill, and everything. So that's why we call it the Unicorn of Bomb verse. Oh, yeah, we have a color. I'm white. Bill is green. And um, Wayne is blue, so now Luke, you need to choose a color unicorn to represent. I'm red. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Let's see where Elsie goes with this. Curtis Hudson. Uh, um, no man will ever look at Jesus Christ and say, oh, oh no, I think I read that. The Bible teaches that Christ bore the sins of all people. Isaiah 53, 6 says, quote, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, that means Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So the iniquity is the sin. He's, all the sin of all mankind was laid upon Jesus Christ. Uh, Isaiah 53, 6. There are twos, uh, he goes on to say, there are twos, uh, the number twos, twos, uh, alls in this verse. The first all speaks of the universal fact of sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the second all speaks of universal atonement. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the all in the first part is Isaiah 53, 6 covers. Uh, if, if all went astray, then the iniquities of all were laid on Christ. Uh, okay, that's Curtis Hudson. So when he talks about universal atonement, then he, he's referencing what we were just saying about this verse, is that the, the first group of all uh, is, mean, means that it's the atonement. Christ atoned, or um, you know, uh, I'm 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 using the word atone because it's so universally used. It's even in the scriptures in some cases uh, uh, the term is used. But um, Aaron Budson did a teaching of comparing atonement to propitiation, and so I I think that the better word for this is propitiation. That means that uh, Jesus paid for every sins everyone sins completely. It's, he made a satisfactory payment. The debt is paid in full. Atonement just means a covering, but it's still there. You'd have to watch Aaron Budgeon's uh, teaching on that. To, I won't try to cover the whole thing. Uh, but the point that, that Curtis Hudson hears, he says it's universal atonement or universal propitiation where everybody's sins are paid for. So uh, he's agreeing with the point that we're making, or, or we should better say we're agreeing with Curtis Hudson's interpretation of this, that everybody's sins are paid for, and now it's just a question of, uh, you know, uh, will we believe so, so that we can receive eternal life? There's, there's, there's two issues here man has. One was there's a sin problem, Jesus paid for that. And then there's a death problem. We're all going to suffer the second death unless we receive life everlasting. If we want life everlasting, we come to Jesus to receive it. Then we don't have to suffer the second death in the lake of fire. Uh, okay, uh, Jackson and Bill, you get to respond to that, and then I'll move on. The whole point of a gift is something that you can receive, let me tell you. It's not something that's forced on you and whatnot. 
So there, mm -hmm. with that in mind, I think what he said is totally accurate. It's not even if it's a good thing, it's really not a gift if you're forced into it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm glad you brought up the term gift again. I wanted to say this earlier uh, when we were talking about uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Uh, and uh, let me see, what is it? Uh, uh, Romans 6.23 or 3.23, the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we use the word gift and it's salvation or eternal life, uh, that Calvinists want to say that that um, the the faith has to be the gift because God has to get all the glory. Because if, if we can choose to believe, then we can claim glory for ourselves and say, look, I chose to believe in Jesus, therefore I get part of the credit, I get part of the glory. But the art problem with that is that um, the, the, the person who gives you the gift gets all the credit. You don't get any credit just because you receive a gift. What do you think of that? <laughs> I'm so wonderful. I got a PSP for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Let's say that a, a rich man came and gave you like you uh, ten million dollars, and, and then and uh, what would we say? Oh man, that rich man was so wonderful the way he treated uh, Jackson. Uh, he was wonderful, and we give all the credit to the rich man. Or are we going to say, that Jackson's a great guy, man. Look how he accepted that gift. Man, yeah, he look, how I honored, look how I honored the rich man with my presence so that he gave me $10 million. Yeah. Now, Brother Bill, you, what do you think of that point? What, what point? What point exactly? The, the point is that. Uh, when uh, when we receive the gift of salvation, do you think that w because you've accepted the gift, you get some of the glory that God should have? Or does God get all the glory because he's the one that gave the gift and all you did was just receive it? Why should you get glory for just receiving the gift? So Calvinists say that if you if you say that you can choose to believe, you, you can take take part of the glory from God. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's fallacious, that is, yeah. Yeah, you know, God gets the glory. You know, he 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 paid the way. He offer. He he does everything. You know, and all we need to do is just say yes or no. You know, yeah. it's not work, it's not us glorifying ourselves. It, it's not anything of ourselves. You know, and the problem is with with, with the Calvinists and, and the Armenians especially. You know, they would argue, you know, philosophical points. You know, monogism and synergism. And, and and the Calvinists would say that we're 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 being you know synergists you know we're helping God in regard to salvation, which is utter nonsense because God has laid it all. He's done everything. So we're not helping God by saying yes, I believe. God has helped us and given us the greatest gift that, that this universe has ever seen, and that is salvation. I look at my. Uh Did we uh, lose Luke? Can you still hear me? Yeah, now. Okay. Uh, I, can you still hear me? Yes, uh, now. Yes. Okay, you can hear me, but, but my icon is on the screen. Now look at that icon. Yes. Let's say that that bottom hand is me and I'm drowning. And then Jesus reaches down to, to save me and pull me out of certain death. And then uh, I grab his hand and he pulls me out. Now, am I going to say how glorious I am, how wonderful I am because I grabbed him? Or are we going to say Jesus gets all the glory because he's the Savior. He's the one that pulled me out. All I did was grab his hand when he was reaching for me. <laughs> oh, okay. I could just imagine. Could you imagine if somebody was actually saved from drowning in your analogy and it made the news or something? And the drowner said, "I'm so wonderful. Look at me accepting this this gift of of not drowning. I I'm the one who the credit should go to." Yeah, yeah, that's how absurd it is that they think that we we we're going to get some glory because we get we get to choose to believe. All the glory goes to the giver of the gift, not the one who accepts the gift. Okay, Wayne says, very good, but the Bible teaches that when a man sins, man is the cause and is responsible, which is why he is punished. 
It is as simple as reading your Bible. Any doctrine, no matter how learned the teachers, teachers are that teach it to you, which does not agree with the whole Bible, should be discarded. Calvinism should have been discarded long ago. Hallelujah. Yeah, it should have. Uh, it's, it's, it's got a rebirth. It's a resurgence now. I mean, it started in the 4th century with Augustine, and then Calvin took it in the, like the 16th century, and, and uh, you know, his name was attached to it, uh, and it's kind of dead. It's been dead. I mean, this whole idea was not recognized in the f first few centuries of the church until Augustine brought it in. Uh, and then, uh, but now people are starting to accept it again. It, but it, it's so stupid. How could anybody believe it? It's evil and stupid. I must be a really mean guy now. I'm really, I'm really coming down on them. But I told you we're going to trample on the tulip today, <laughs> which we've done. Yeah. We hardly even need to go into the next point with the with the um, perseverance of the saints because well, we've got the irresistible is, grace before this. We're only on li limited atonement right now. Well, but weren't we talking about irresistible grace when you uh, talked we about we jumped ahead the accepting we've, the gift? We've got a lot yeah. to go. Uh, yeah. Let me. Let me just say this. Uh, there's a little. There's a little bit more from uh, uh, from uh, Curtis Hudson. Let me read it. We'll comment on it, and then I think we should probably break this into two parts. And we'll talk about irresistible, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints, and and also do the contradiction uh, ver, uh, points from Wayne. Wayne has a whole list of Calvinist cal contradictions that we can discuss. Uh, we can do that next time. Uh, so we've already gone past our normal time, but so let's finish this point up here real quick here. Um, not only did he bear, uh, okay, uh, nothing could be plainer than the fact that Jesus died for every man. First Timothy two five and six says, "For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all." Romans eight thirty two states. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Um, John uh, 3.16, uh, John 3.36. Let me, I've got a couple of other verses here that I've saved myself that let me look at and see. Um, we covered 1 Timothy, uh, Romans. Oh, okay. Here's one we have to we don't want to neglect. Romans 5:18. Uh, let me post it in here. We'll see. Okay, Romans 5. Uh, 5:18. Okay, it says, therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now, uh, this is really a killer verse against Calvinism here, because you've got the word all men in two parts of this verse. The first part it says all men to condemnation. So Calvinists would have to agree that all men are condemned. That all means every person, not just all nations, not just all group, uh, you know, representatives from each ethnicity. It, no, it means all people are condemned. We're born lost. We need to get saved. And then you go to the second part of the same verse, and it says all men unto justification. So they would have to change the definition for the word all in this one verse which appears twice where they say in the first part it means all people and the second part it just means all all of the elect that's that that's what they have to do with this verse here you see the problem with that Jackson yeah because it says all men to condemnation does that mean yeah. only some are yeah. to condemnation yeah, so all men there means all people, all every single person ever born is born condemned, right? Right, and, so and most Calvinists would even agree with that. Yeah, that word does not mean uh, all uh, representatives from all different groups of the world, like the Calvinists say, well, well, some people in Africa will be saved, some are elect in Africa, some in North America, you know, they, they say that, you know, all means 
uh, elect from all different places around the world, all different groups. Okay, but they obviously the word all here means every single person ever born. And then in the very same verse, when all is used a second time, are they going to turn around and say it doesn't mean all pers people ever born? Under justification, the, the free gift is offered. That's how that's this verse totally kills them. They cannot. They have to say all means two different things within the same verse. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and and of course, th th this is just more reasons why they need their own dictionary and translation and whatnot. Yeah, just a few more minutes. Okay. Yeah, they yeah they need to put that in their dictionary. That'll be an interesting explanation in their dictionary, yeah. huh? Yeah. Okay. Of how of how a word suddenly changes meaning next sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Where's uh, we did that one? We did that one? We did that one? Uh, okay. All right. Those are the ver all the verses. I think we've covered all the basic verses to make this point about irresistible grace. So I mean, um, limited atonement. So we got. The total inability of man, we've, just, we've refuted that. The unconditional election of man, we've refuted that. The limited atonement that Christ's death on the cross paid for only some people's sin, we refuted that. So in next Sunday, we're going to talk about their last two points of TULIP, irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints, and if we have time, I think we will, uh, then Brother Wayne, if you could have all of your contra uh, contradic Calvinistic contradiction verses things there, I love those things. And I'd like to go through this because we can end with a good laugh. about We can laugh at Calvinism in the end. So uh, let me ask this. Uh, uh, let's let's uh, do uh, an invitation. Brother Jackson, do you want to do the invitation? For the sure. Sure. I, I would hate for someone to, you know, learn all this stuff about Calvinism and and then still not be saved because they, never, they didn't hear they didn't hear about how to get saved. So, would you invite people to come to Jesus and be saved? Go ahead. Sure. Salvation is very simple. Essentially, you know, the Bible says we're all sinners and no amount of good works on our part, no amount of reforming ourselves, no amount of any of that would ever be enough to save us because our sin is is the is the is an issue of separation between man and God which is why Jesus Christ came to the cross and paid for all your sins and all of my sins and every person who ever lived by the way as we've been trying to uh, make the point in this past few minutes and past half hour or whatever so Jesus Christ has died for your sins he's died for my sins he's died for the sins of everyone in the world and offers eternal life to anyone who simply believes on him for it. The Bible says in Acts 16.31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, what you get when you believe on Christ is everlasting life, meaning this can never be lost for any reason whatsoever. No matter how atrocious of an act you commit, as unacceptable as it is, it is not powerful enough to negate this payment for sin that came through Jesus Christ that he and and the gifts of God it says in Ephesians are irrevocable so once you simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation you have the irrevocable eternal gift of eternal life that can never be lost mm, man that is good news that is really good news and that's why I know you've just told us the true gospel because I'm so happy I'm happy to hear it uh, that there in other words Jesus paid for all my sins and he's offering me eternal life as a free gift, and there's no strings attached. There's Zero. nothing I have to do on my part. He just wants me to receive this gift. Mm -hmm. now, By simple belief on him. There's one question I want to ask you, though. Okay, now, see, you, you mentioned that he paid for all of our sins on the cross, and now he's offering us eternal life. How do I know that he has this power and ability to, uh, to give me eternal life? Well, Jesus is God in the flesh. He's God's perfect Son, and 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 is God the Son as well. See, he's he's um he, he's he's his divinity is what gives him the power to be able to take the payment for us. That's because we're not divine. We cannot die for our own sins, 
and we cannot pay for our own sins, but with his infinite divinity and power, he was able to do that for us. Did, did he give us any kind of a sign that, that, that gives us all confidence to say, I, I believe he does have the power of life and death. I believe he can give me eternal life. Did he he sure did. He, he rose from the dead. He, he okay. rose from the dead three days after dying on the cross. I hope I mentioned that. I'm very sorry if no, I didn't. No, that's, that's why I'm doing these follow-up questions. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I almost always, I guess I just slipped up there, mentioned the resurrection after the death and everything. Yes. Yeah, the resurrection is the sign that gives us confidence, that makes uh, makes our faith in him justified. I Absolutely. feel justified in believing in Jesus because he raised himself from the dead. Therefore, I feel confident that he can do that for me. Amen. Okay. Thank you, brother. That was beautiful. I'm going to ask... Uh, Brother Bill, to, to make any final remarks here, and then we're going to close the show. Yeah, I just want to just basically agree with the, the, the brief salvation message that Jackson's just given, and you can't really add more to it, but if that's okay, I just wanted to just quote the scriptures, you know, in, in regard to the resurrection that, that, that may help people to understand that because that Christ rose from the dead, you know, those who believe in him, you know, be risen also. So if that's all right with you, I could read a few yeah, verses. Yeah, yeah, brother. Yeah, and so this is in this is in one Corinthians chapter fifteen, and verses we, we go from twelve, and it says, "Now if now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say this is because this was talking about people who didn't believe in his resurrection. How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead, but if there be no resurrection of the dead." then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain. And so you also your faith. You know, so that is basically telling us, you know, if you if you believe in a Christ, you know, but not the Christ of the Bible, who, who was victorious over death and rose having defeated it, then, then our preaching and our and our faith and our belief will be vain. Yeah. You know, the risen of risen Christ and he's the one we believe in. You know, he was victorious. Amen. He was victorious at Calvary. He was victorious in the grave. And he was victorious as he rose from the grave. So, you know, my, my advice for anybody listening who isn't a believer, just believe that, that Christ loves you so much that he did die for all your sins, was buried, and rose again victorious according to the scriptures. If you believe on that, Jesus, the one we preach here today, you will be eternally saved and secure with Christ. Amen. I'm, I'll be coming out right now. Okay, my wife's calling me for dinner here, but let me just say this. Uh, uh, for everybody who's watching this now, uh, I, I, I hope you've learned a lot about the um, stupidity and, and uh, of Calvinism. And if you watch the first part of this uh, like we did last week, you'll see how evil Calvinism is. Uh, but we're not just here to teach you about Calvinism. We're here to invite you to embrace Jesus as your Savior. So please, if you if you understood this message of salvation, if you understand how simple it is, you know, we're not asking you to join a religion. We're not asking you to become a religious person or, or follow some set of religious rules. We're asking you to trust a person. The person is God Almighty who became a man named Jesus. He paid for all your sins. He rose from the dead. He proved he's God. He proved he has the power of life and death. He wants to give you eternal life. Will you accept it? Just put your faith completely in him. 100%. Reject the idea that, that you could save yourself or that you can contribute somehow and that Jesus didn't do enough and now you've got to do your part. No. Put your faith completely in Jesus and nothing else. And he gives you eternal life. If you do that, please make a comment on the video. Thank. I want to thank the panelists for uh, for helping me today, and I'm looking forward to next week. Uh, and uh, I'm going to close the live broadcast, but I'm going to keep this private conversation going so you, we can talk as long as we like. Okay. So um, final uh, is uh, thing I want to say is um, I pray that all of you will be blessed and. Please rest in the love and grace of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.